Good morning and good afternoon. Um, everyone, this is Theo Nasser from Right Hand Cybersecurity. I'm excited to kick off today's webinar. Uh, I am joined here today by James Linton, a social engineer and the founder of The Whole. I'm really excited about today's session with James because we're going to talk to him and ask him to take us inside the mind of a social engineer. And of course, we're gonna ask him all about the incident where he fished the White House, an event um, that you may have seen or you may have heard, which actually generated some media buzz on entertainment outlets like CNN and Jimmy Kimmel. So for our audience here today, if you have any questions throughout today's session, please add them into our Q&A window uh, at the bottom, and I will do my best to work those questions into today's discussion. All right. So with that, I'll stop sharing my screen. We're going to officially get started here. Uh, and I'd like to start um, just by introducing James. James, if you could maybe just take a few minutes um, to tell us a little bit about yourself and your background here before we dive in. Sure. Um, yeah. So I'm James Linton. I'm, I guess I'm an ex-social engineer. I still think like a social engineer, but I guess I don't practice it as much. Um, but my career before cybersecurity was in design. I worked in advertising as a web designer. So emails, branding, that kind of thing. Um, but I, I guess even at that stage, I was still quite interested in the psychology of marketing emails, which <laughs> kind of like phishing emails. People still want you to click on them and still triggering emotions to get you to do that. And it, I always found like if you change the button to a certain color, would that encourage someone to click? That would be interesting. Um, and then tra transitioned into cybersecurity. <laughs> Excellent. Awesome. Well, James, we're, we're really excited to, to have you on today. There's a lot that I want to cover with you. You've got a very interesting background and you've been involved in some, some very interesting things in the security industry. Um, but maybe before we dive into that, you, you just shared a little bit about your background as a designer, your background in advertising. Uh, maybe just take a couple minutes, like tell us about the pivot that you made and maybe when it was, how, how recently did you jump into cybersecurity and what prompted that pivot? Um, yeah, it was interesting, really. I guess what brought me into cybersecurity was doing lots of things that the industry found interesting. At the time, I didn't have the, the link back to I was doing cybersecurity type stuff. Um, it all sort of began, it was 2017, and my mindset was I wanted to play a joke on my friend at work. That was my reason for stumbling across this idea of pretending to be my CEO over email and sending him an email that said something that, and the fun bit for me was taking just enough of the, um, the, the, the kind of DNA of a CEO's way of writing and kind of combining that with something that was um, <laughs> going to antagonize him, I guess, uh, to a certain extent. So I, I sort of set up the email account. Um, and at the time, it felt dangerous because I was, you know, I was on a works computer and so I was, it was just a normal Gmail account that I was now typing my CEO's name into uh, and then hitting create. And it kind of, uh, one part of my brain was like going, God, what was if you accidentally, you know, emailed the CEO directly with this and, you know, coming up with all these panicking situations. But the other side of me was just hugely excited about the fact I was about to play this joke on my friend. So I quickly wrote out an email and sent it to him. Um, I think it said something along the lines of come to the meeting room after work and if you have a lawyer, bring them with you, something like that. It was, it was kind of a bit nasty, I guess, but I knew he could take it. I guess that was me keeping control of the situation as best I could to, to, to do it to somebody who I knew wouldn't start crying or, you know, just um, have it backfire. But he doesn't, he didn't check his email very often. So he kind of sat there for about an hour with me, just the adrenaline waning down and stuff. And then he sort of looked at it. And then two seconds later, quick as a flash, looked straight back at me. And I was kind of going like that, trying, <laughs> trying not to laugh. And I've been rumbled. I'd failed. I'd not tricked him. But it was fun. And I thought, well, you know, kind of roll this out. And I sort of did. I, I kind of I thought, let's, you know, take this up a notch and gave out a few secret missions to people. Um, I, I, I awarded somebody um, 
they were selected to go on the intercompany games, they had to fly out and do swimming competitions and stuff. And the problem was that I couldn't really control when my CEO would come back into the building. So it fast became um, a heart-stopping moment for me when I was midway through tricking somebody. And I'd suddenly see the real CEO, obviously I was just a fake one, <laughs> wander back in. Um, so sense got the better of me and I kind of decided to delete the account and retire from the work-based pranks. And that sort of resurged. I had a little bit of a falling out of a bank and it, it kind of, the two ideas merged where, um, because we'd had a correspondence over email, that I could maybe uh, trick, <laughs> trick the CEO of the bank. And it was successful and like most successful things and like anyone who, feels proud that they've managed to do something. I posted it on Twitter and it ended up in the Financial Times. Um, but then I, I was kind of, I had this thing, I had sort of built this thing then, you know, I knew that people had found it really fascinating and interesting I'd been able to do it. And I decided to do more of it, I guess. And I was sort of post-rationalizing it along the way as this was an experiment in discovering how secure people were. Um, I think in reality, it was just me having a laugh. It was just, you know, it was a puzzle. It was trying to decide what I needed to say, who I needed to be, and trying to make each challenge I set myself a little bit harder to keep getting that one-upmanship, I guess. Um, and yeah, It all started as a joke. And so it, it started... It's it started as you trying to joke and prank your buddy, and then it evolved. Yeah. It evolved into pranking and joking a bank CEO, and then it's just continued to evolve um, from that initial joke that you had for a buddy of yours. Yeah, because obviously the the banks was almost like a theme, so you know the the papers were picking up on it. That's kind of why I continued to do banks because. Right. It made sense as well because they are seen as, or you presume that their security would be the pinnacle of what security could be. It being, you know, such um, a, a, a sort of fortified place. And the fact I was able to do it, it seemed, I don't know, it seemed to it seemed part of the workflow to keep seeing if it would work elsewhere. So I went over to American banks, tried there. Um, I was always trying to make it a bit trickier. So I, I remember tricking one bank. I can't remember who it was now. It was an American bank. And they fell for it. And I posted it on Twitter. The story got published. I then took the URL of that story and, and sent that to another bank, uh, bank CEO. And they replied like, oh, God, yeah, you can't be too careful. Hope this is our real chairman, <laughs> exclamation mark. So I'd sort of... I don't know. It, it felt like a, a very strange thing to be doing at the time, but it, it was it was it was kind of surreal and really felt like a game. And I think the fact it was all done on my yeah. phone, it wasn't sort of hidden away, made it more game like to me. I was just playing with the same variables. It was what was I saying? Who was I contacting? Who was I pretending to be? And that turned about out to be exactly how scammers operate. And I didn't know that at the time. I had no understanding of email threats whatsoever. Um, no training, no kind of cyber skills. Um, but apparently I was doing certain things. I was fishing people. I was social engineer, engineering people, but I didn't know what it was. So there was a certain... You caught on, you, you caught on quickly, that, that's for sure. And I, I think the, the incident here that was really compelling and interesting to me was the one that made national news in the US and, and perhaps global news uh, but I, I remember seeing and reading about it in CNN. I remember seeing a skit with uh, Jimmy Kimmel. I shouldn't even call it a skit. It was just during his um, his nightly show where Jimmy Kimmel actually spoke uh, about the incident. And what I'm referencing, James, is when you fished the White House, you, you did uh, similar to what you had just described with these U.S. banks. Yeah. You had actually impersonated very high profile U.S. politicians, and you had sent phishing emails or social engineer, socially engineered emails to U.S. politicians, which prompted replies. And it, based on the, the, the story that I had read, is you actually engaged in a back and forth dialogue where the politician you were speaking with thought they were responding and replying to another politician, uh, when in actuality, it was just yourself. 
Um, at, at least this is how the story was outlined uh, on CNN with Jake Tapper and also on Jimmy Kimmel. I'd, I'd love to if you could maybe just explain, tell us, you know, what year was this? Um, you know, at a high level, what, what did you do? It sounds like the reason why you did it was for fun. It, it sounds like you kind of just got a kick out of these games and these interactions since yeah. they were yeah. working. Uh, but, you know, sh share with our audience here today. What is it that you did? When did you do it? Who were you sending emails to? Um, and kind of what was the tone? What was the content um, of these phishing emails that you were sending back and forth? I mean, from a, a technical point of view, every email I sent from the, the joke at work to tricking CEOs of banks to tricking the White House, I was just using uh, using free webmail accounts. I was just using display name deception. So the name of the account was just who I was pretending to be. There was there was no kind of, there was no more technical trickery to it than that. I didn't even use a VPN. I don't, I don't think I even knew what one was at that stage. So it was kind of, the bare minimum of technical support needed. I guess I've later found out that most of the, the things that were making it successful were associated with why we all fall for phishing tricks. And that's that email is voiceless and faceless, but we are conditioned to trust it unless we suspect otherwise. And the suspecting otherwise, that's what social engineers kind of play with and, and try and avoid that suspicion reaching a point where it stops you in your tracks and you can amplify it, I guess. So with the White House, um, I mean, once I'd done a certain number of banks, certainly at work, um, people were, at first they were kind of high fives and, um, you know, well done. Towards the end, it was getting a, a lot less high five and very much you should stop this now. Um, so I think as a final fanfare, I, I kind of thought, well, you know, what is the, the biggest thing that I can kind of have a go at trying to trick and the White House seemed the obvious choice. Um, and then started the, you know, I didn't really know who was in the White House at the time. So, you know, I went online, did my open source research. I found out who was a member of the White House, had a look down. It was, you know, it wasn't like picking a, um, a meal off a menu, but I was trying to find the one that fitted the best profile that would, you know, people would resonate with and the head of homeland security was somebody who worked there i, I sort of ruled out the uh, the president himself because there's a lot of talk about him not even using email it just seemed too too tricky to do it seemed like a, a bit of a waste of effort where head of homeland security seems more you know if i could do that then maybe because at this point obviously my career was <laughs> shriveling and um, my current career so I, I did kind of have an eye on how i could transition into cyber and you know trying to do things that were maybe um showed a bit more i don't know technical skill i guess to a certain extent um but looking back i, I was still very naive i saw a bounce back from an, one of the first emails i sent and it was to um, whitehouse.gov which is the main house website now that makes me laugh now that they would people at the white house would be using the you know the the, the brochure website um white house email address um it, it was it was different from that but it still wasn't that well hidden away you know it was just googling around and these aren't sort of domain names that change year on year they you know they're fairly long standing and once you have a few people that work there that have outwardly facing roles say pr or marketing and that email just, you know, gets into a, a PDF somewhere about an event they're holding. You can start to figure out the how they they kind of format the, the names for them. Um, and it was slightly trickier because, especially with American email addresses, they use the middle initial quite often, and that, that, that can add an extra variable in there. So I just went for a kind of spray gun attempt, I guess. I, I figured out a few different formats it could be. And, you know, sort of um, blind CC'd them and, and hit send on an email. So my MO at that stage was to invite people to a party because I saw it as being a way of not getting into, into huge trouble, I guess, from the law and not having the person that was tricked into being invited to a party wanting to, you know, um, have any kind of... Um, you know, push back against me and, 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 you know, try and get the law enforcement after me or something. So I decided I was going to be Jared Kushner, put both those names into a Google news search. And the first news article that came up, I just kind of skimmed down it. And I noticed that they were both in Iraq at the same time. 
Um, and there wasn't really much more detail than that, but my head kind of took a bit of a lateral approach to it and thought, well, if I reference that my party will have food that was as good as that we ate in Iraq, then that's kind of, it can't really be disproved. It's not saying they both ate together. It's not saying that, um, you know, they both had the same experience eating the food, but it is, a, it is this kind of little nugget or little hook of plausibility that links them both. And it was, it was that kind of very personal information, which actually isn't that personal. It was just in a news article. It wasn't, um, you know, hard to find. It was that, I think, that unlocks people and makes them feel um, it isn't a scam because, you know, why would a scammer even mention that? And, you know, also I wasn't asking for anything directly. There's not anything to really trigger that response mechanism where you'll go, just a minute, I'm being tricked. Um, and he replied, he accepts it. He was, he was up for the party. Um, he even included his personal email address to, to stay in touch. So, um, so you, you you basically conducted some basic reconnaissance, right? A, a common yeah. tactic that any any criminal would do. You you, you did your own basic re- reconnaissance by searching online on Google a little bit yeah. about these folks. Um, you identified that these two politicians that worked in the White House had both been in Iraq at a similar time, and so you took the identity of one of them emailed the other inviting them to a party and you found a common ground between them by saying i promise our party will have food that is as good as what we ate in iraq and through that and through that you essentially received a reply because i mean it, it it almost sounds like it was an inside joke like you 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 created some common ground between the two and, and you alluded to something where you know if you read that you don't think twice you're like of, of course this is someone i know who, who's referencing a you know something that we had shared in the past no yeah, yeah. And, and i think this is really interesting from you, you hear it talks about a lot about these hyper personalized spear phishing emails and in a way this sort of blows out the water how much reconnaissance somebody would need to do to make it personal it, it would just be you know often if it's a company that you, you're targeting then it, the latest news article that mentions the company you can just send over and say have you seen this and that is you know super personal and and things like that so Afterwards, I was able to look back on that time and take it apart a bit more and find out what was working, why it was working, and and try and apply that to now, I guess, you know, how easy would it be to to pass off these personal sounding emails without them being that personal? That one day AI could be pulling in these bits of information into some scammer's algorithm. We just, you know, the the future could be quite tricky if uh, that level of um, creation becomes more widespread. So I get a bit fanciful there, but I think it's always interesting to to think of a very future use of something that's kind of only a human can do now, because eventually it will be done by, by a machine. I'd imagine. Did you, Did you get in trouble? So you know, it it, it became pretty high profile, right? You've yeah. got a, a one of the leading news outlets reporting on it. You've got a talk show host that's making jokes about it. You know, was there ever a follow up from the White House? Was there ever a follow up from authorities? Did you ever? I mean, you obviously post about this on your social media. You're openly raising your hand saying I'm the the, the person who did this. Right. I know you didn't have any malicious intent of um, stealing anything. There was no ransomware that you had installed in your your email. There, there was yeah. um, you, there was no ask for a wire transfer. You weren't actually stealing anything. You were like you like you call yourself. You were pranking. You were it was an email prank. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. I'm curious, j- just because you know it, it did receive such national attention, you get in trouble. Uh, no, 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 whatsoever. Never, not once contacted by an authority. Not once um, contacted by anyone who I tricked or the organisation they worked for. Essentially, nothing had happened, um, which sort of makes sense because you know criminals every day send out attacks, and there's no consequence to that, um, and they're actually trying to take money off people. They can do it endlessly. They can do it day after day after day. Um, so from that point of view, it, it makes sense. But I'd also been, I did have an underlying sort of ethics to it. I wouldn't then 
you know, go after the person again. I wouldn't give out the email address. I wouldn't, you know, I, I wanted it to be as controlled by me as possible. It would be, could I trick them? Yes or no. And then that would be it. I'd kind of move on. With the White House, I did actually return. <laughs> I went back, I think it was five weeks later or something, and thought, you know, I'm, I'm going to try it again, see if anything's changed. Um, and I, this time I used my email prankster um, domain name and just changed the display name. And I still managed to trick people. So that for me now is interesting that the reaction to it was because Sarah Sanders, you know, said on the news, we take all these things very seriously and we're looking into it. But nothing had changed to prevent that type of attack from going through. And I was still able to do it. And I guess I found that worrying as well that, you know, if I was doing it, then who else was doing it and what was their intention? Um, mm -hmm. You know, hopefully it's just, it, it's very hard to see how other people weren't doing the same thing, but had completely different intentions. You and I had, had talked about this as well. A after your successful prank of fishing the White House, you you started phishing the fishers. And what I mean by that yeah. is you started sending phishing emails and um, communicating know, it was with criminals, with hackers, right? So, so yeah. you, 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 were, you were now communicating not, not to White House officials or politicians, not to bank CEOs, but now you were actually in phishing email engagement and communications with real cyber criminals um, who do have yeah. malicious intent. So I'm, yeah. I'm, I'd love, to, how did that come about? What, what's the context behind that? And I think most importantly, what did you learn from, from that back and forth? Yeah, so at the end of the prank, the end of arguably my previous career, I, I was very fortunate and had an opportunity to work for um, an email security company um, based in America. I, I was working remotely, but it's nice to say it was in America. Um, and they had a really interesting thing that they were developing. And it was, um, they were engaging with BEC um, attacks that were coming in against their customers. So these were getting stopped. And then they were picking up the, the reins of that and, and replying and then having an interaction. And at first, I think it was just to explore and see what benefit could be had from that. Because often we see the beginning or the, the, the initial pretext, but we don't always see how it unfolds after that. And, you know, we could learn you know, how they kind of pivot and, and, and how they operate afterwards. And then it reached a point where they realized that they it was easy to take the, the bank account details off them because a lot of these were targeting accounts teams. They were the CFO or the CEO, and they wanted an invoice paying as soon as possible. So they would say, sure, yeah, happy to do that. Send over the bank details and, you know, we'll make the payment. And then they would send over the bank details. So they thought, well, you know, maybe if, if we say this bank account doesn't work, we can probably ask for another one. And, it, you know, again, another lot of bank account details would come over. And I think that was quite important to establish because now you were sort of collecting these pots that many different scams could be directing money towards. I mean, it's never going to wipe out, um, you know, online criminality in a big way, but it's going to start disrupting it to a certain extent. So that was really interesting. Uh, I think the record, it was into double figures how many bank accounts we got off one person. And this is why it's so different um, for a scammer, because a scammer was emailing in and we'd anonymize the email. So we'd completely replace uh, the domain that we were replying from, the name it was sent to, and our name. And this sort of shows how much of a production line it is at the scammer's end. If a reply comes into them that shows the pretext they sent out, even if they think, I'm not even sure we targeted this domain. They will just naturally assume we must have done. It's a kind of cognitive bias, I guess, that they think, yeah, we've sent out that much stuff. This is replied to us. They just pick up the reins and start copying and pasting their bits of script into the rest of it because most of them weren't very adept social engineers. They were just good at going through a process of copying and pasting stuff. Um, but they were they were kind of in a bit of a predicament because the reward for them to continue believing it was so great that they couldn't really drop off. They could have a really high suspicion that something wasn't right about what was happening, but did they just cut the losses and break off from this engagement that could land them, you know, maybe a life changing amount of money or do they just kind of sit it out because they, it's hard for them to reconcile what 
the consequence to them would be for, for having another reply. They don't probably know that we would forward these on directly to banks, uh, the account numbers. And, you know, I don't think they saw their exposure as being that bad. So that made it very easy for us. We could literally say, <laughs> say almost anything and we'd keep getting replies. And it, it kind of showed how, um, and a lot of these were sort of West African BC, um, BC groups. So the, 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 the kind of, um, I, I think just the, the sort of office-based um, syntax and language was often lacking once you push them off the script. Um, but we'd get, you know, geolocational data and, and, and things like this. And to a certain extent, we even managed to semi-automate it. So if, if something was coming in asking, asking for gift cards, it would send an automatic reply to that saying, yeah, sure, what do you want and stuff. And we were kind of just trying to collect as much data from these att attacks as possible um, and take out the human side. But I found that it was so different going for a kind of a CEO or somebody else because the, the, the scammer has no way of knowing what the person they're contacting is going to be like anyway, how they're going to write, how they're going to act. So, and, and they had no way of verifying it if they did sort of start to suspect it might not, <laughs> might not be um, the person they were trying to trick. So, yeah, it was it was a real interesting dynamic, but I think the main takeout was that the, the skills of these scammers was really quite quite poor. Um, generally speaking, it was hard. It was, it was rare that you found one that was good at it. And you've kind of come full circle here in your security journey, right? You, you shared with us how you entered into the industry um, hmm. really through just fun and, and curiosity. It sounds like. Um, and then it kind of evolved into almost becoming like a hobby. If it's okay, if I describe it like that, you were doing these yeah. non-malicious social engineering experiments as a hobby. Um, you know, you're repeatedly doing it with banks. You did it with, with the politicians in the white house. Uh, but now, I mean, you've kind of come full circle and, and now I know you operate a business that helps educate people on how to spot malicious emails so they don't become victimized by them. Right. You're, you're kind of in that cyber awareness and education space now today, um, yeah. So you've kind of come full circle, right? You are you are now preventing the bad guys from being successful in their social engineering attempts. Um, just in your experience, and I'm kind of bridging this into a question we got from our audience here. I know we've only got uh, just a couple minutes left here, James. Um, so really quick. Like, That's gone where, so quick. <laughs> where, where, where do you see the line being crossed here, right? Whether it's yourself or or. Uh, as a non-malicious ethical hacker, if, if you will, or um, with a real criminal, like wh where is that line being crossed, right? So what you did with the, the White House and what you did with some bank CEOs is um, yeah. you just asked some questions and you started dialogue, really. And you kind of stirred the pot with a couple of your questions that you had asked with some of your content. Um, where Where is the line drawn? Like, where does this become not okay? Like, what, how far can you or someone go without this becoming questionable where maybe a consequence um, becomes necessary? Yeah, I, th I think it's it's kind of interesting. In, in some ways, I now look back on, you know, tricking CEOs and people like that um, as a bit like a, an unfair phishing simulation in some respects because i've triggered an emotion that um and i didn't realize it at the time i don't think i had the empathy or and it was too game like for me to fully connect with what i was doing um but i think triggering that kind of emotion of embarrassment and things like that um was probably you know not worth the joke i guess as as such um so from that standpoint, it, it, it was probably, I, you know, I wouldn't do it again now. I just wouldn't do it again now anyway, because in the last four years, the information and the, the sort of the hunt for truthful information is so much more important to security, to, you know, just people's livelihoods and, and people's safety. That to start interjecting things that were seen quite funny back then, you know, could have huge consequences that I couldn't contain now. Um, you know, if I said something to somebody in the White House, um, you know, it could, could cause huge problems. So I guess it, it's tricky. And the, the consequences are there for scammers, but it's just so hard to apply them. We often found that we, we, we could identify genuine criminals who've done a variety of crimes from romance scams to check fraud to BC attacks. 
you know, we had like a full almost dossier of information relating to who it was. And if we pass that over to um, law enforcement, it was it was really hard for them to then act on it. They had to kind of use that as a treasure map and figure out how they could then access that information themselves in through the channels and, you know, across different regions and jurisdictions. It was just incredibly hard. And I think that was the point that I realised that, you know, we're never going to arrest our way out of these problems. It's going to be persistent. It's going to be here forever. The fact that people will be out there scamming because fraud which is what it is, is it's persistent. It's a, you know, it's a, a career for people outside of the online world and will be on the, uh, the online world. Which, which is why it, it's so important to constantly educate, you know, the, the purpose for a webinar like this and, you know, for a lot of the content that you produce and that my company produces, it's really just to educate, right? If the, the more that we can educate and make people aware of these types of things, even CNN and Jimmy Kimmel, right? The fact that they even spoke to to your email prank incident, it educated people that these things happen. This is what it looks like. This is how easy it is to do. And anyone is vulnerable, uh, which I I think is an important message here to take away. Well, James, um, as you said, time did fly by. Um, I I just want to thank you very much for for your time today. It was a lot of fun hearing your story and just kind of getting a peek under the hood of the mindset of an email prankster, um, as you, you call yourself. Um, So thank you so much. And and to our audience, um, thank you guys all very much for joining us today as well. We hope you learned something uh, around social engineering and enjoyed the stories here from James. We look forward to seeing you all again in a future webinar. Um, And with that, I'll go ahead and and close this off. Thank you all for your time today. We'll talk again soon. Thank you very much. Thank you, James. Bye, everyone.